left of the box. Hello folks, before we get started, I want to quickly make note that the last few live streams I've done had severe video problems, which I found out about way too late. The image freezes every few seconds. However, the audio is just fine. I believe I found the source of the problem and will work towards fixing it for future live streams. So unfortunately, it means the effort I put into my hair and makeup was all for naught, as you'll have to treat this clip more like a podcast. Thank you for your patience as I continue to learn how to be a content creator. Also, content warning. This segment talks about mental health issues and suicide. Anyway, let's get on to the actual thing that I was meaning to talk about with the majority report. So there was a segment on the other day that had Alex Jones in it. I give you uh, Russell Brand and Alex Jones. I feel like you have suffered a lot and I feel that you have a lot of power in you. And I wonder how you... I Stop it. So can I just say, like, I would love for Sam to be talked to by Russell Brand in on this way, way in that exact same way. Yeah. I, <laughs> You've suffered a lot. You have, a lot, you have a lot of power in you. Power in you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's about time like somebody did. <laughs> you have suffered a lot, and I feel that you have a lot of power in you. And mm. I wonder how True. you align the necessity for surrender in order that we may convey a great ever-present omnipresent omniscient Jones. wisdom accessible to all of us if we are clear with your own rather robust individualism i wonder if you ever feel fracture <laughs> and crisis within yourself this is like every hippie stereotype from the 60s when they're like high on every drug possible at the same time <laughs> type conversation I have ever heard. I wonder if even under attack you've ever thought about ending your own life. I wonder <laughs> if you've ever been concerned that you are mentally ill. I wonder if you've ever felt hopeless and desperate given the escalation of these crises and the way that you have been attacked. <laughs> You know, God does things to me. I'll just say this. I'm not trying to brag. It's just you ask the question. <laughs> I'll wake up at 335 in the morning or whenever it is. And God will say, the spirit will say to me. Well, can I just say you know one thing? Like, it, you know, <laughs> we've had guests on this show. Well, at least one I can think of who I, I felt like after the interview, I'm like, that person is, is is um, mentally and emotionally unstable and um and you know had i had that idea beforehand i i, I wouldn't have invited them on because i i just don't um it's obviously not healthy for them and it's not like what's the what's the point of that mm -hmm. um and i don't know if if russell brandt in asking that question is acknowledging i think you're a little bit off mentally off um as some way of like sort of like but you know what why are you having him on i'm gonna say yeah like, if you need guidance the, in this you don't want to be here where, with alex jones and what's the, we, what's the value though like what is the value like i mean you know honestly like i you know particularly if you um are out there trying to sort of espouse a uh, political ideology and you know being a truth teller if you think this guy is emotionally um uh, unstable and is you know potentially uh, suicidal like what are, what are we to learn from this like what is it that you're doing here well he's um, trying to essentially i mean i take it in a way that's almost uh congratulatory towards jones like the weight of the things that you have uncovered must be so heavy and the and the res response that you've gotten from the public yeah. is just so much to bear have you ever been able yeah have you ever thought about taking your own life because by the way you have a one billion dollar judgment against you and that's not going away anytime soon it's also you know to perceive that as an attack Right. It'll you know, be really like, you know, when you when you're found liable for lying about something like that and ruining the lives of people, it's a little bit weird to perceive that as an attack. But as, they're they're loose colleagues at this point. Right. Because Alex it. Jones is doing regular appearances on Crowder's program on Rumble. OK, um, that was basically the, the part of the uh, video I wanted to get onto. So one thing. <laughs> That they should never, like, the idea of Russell Brand just outright asking Alex Jones, like, hey, are you suicidal? Are you balanced right now? Never do that to somebody 
who isn't there specifically to talk about that. Like, if that is just out of the blue uh, conversation, like, he wasn't on there to talk about mental health, that is not something you do to somebody you suspect might have those mental health issues. But Sam's response in particular to this really got me wondering, have I, like, shot myself in the foot from networking with other lefty content creators? Because I talk about my mental health a lot. I made a video not that long ago where I was talking about my suicidal feelings. I am not mentally stable right now. I look it. I'm a little bit better than I was over the weekend, but I know it's about to get worse due to an anniversary of something coming up. Part of the reason why I talk so openly about it is I'm autistic and we overshare. <laughs> but also, I feel it's important to talk about this sort of thing. Because there isn't a day that goes by where I don't think about how much I want to die. And I'm not the only person like this. And so your options are you can talk about it and then lose out on opportunities because people view you as being unstable and damaged. Or you don't talk about it and you never realize that you're not alone with it. But there was like one point that was very important that Sam also made. Like what are what is the purpose? What are you doing? So again, if you're on there specifically to talk about mental health issues, then so be it. But if somebody is unstable and they're on there for the wrong reasons, which they can be, then it can be dangerous for that person afterwards if they don't get the reaction they were hoping they wanted or were expecting or somehow needing to feel validated within. And if they get something that's the polar opposite of that, then it could be very bad for them. But something I try to teach people when it comes to suicidality and stuff like that is it's never one thing that causes people to go over the edge. But a lot of people are afraid of being the last thing. And so a lot of people distance themselves from me, especially when I'm in my lower moods, because they don't want to feel responsible. They don't want to be the person who accidentally says something wrong and then later off I I, I don't make it. But the thing is, is it wasn't that one thing. It never is that one thing. It's a buildup of so many other things. And the fact that you're that close to suicide to begin with means there's a whole lot of other stuff going wrong already. And you're already primed in that position. It makes me wonder if this is part of the reason why I have so many, so much problems networking is if people look at me as being unstable. Like, I don't know about the majority report. I'm not saying anything about them. Like, yeah, sure, I'd love to go on the show, but for what? <laughs> like, that's the thing, for what? I'm not an expert in anything, so to go on for an interview, why? Like, what would I be talking about? Why would they be bringing me on? Like, the most I could imagine is maybe a Thursday when they need somebody who isn't a male to help balance things out. But even then, there's lots of things that go on behind the scenes. Like, they have to really know who I am, which they don't. There, there's, they have to, the compatibility issues and all this other stuff. Like even when I was working at Rebel HQ and I asked directly to go on to the other shows, there were so many other uh, factors that I'm not aware of that went into it where I was denied that opportunity. And even for my show, when I invite people on, I want it to be for a specific reason. Like, yeah, sure. I'd love to have Lance from Surf to come on to my show. Or what exactly? <laughs> Like, he's great, but I don't know, I don't have something that I specifically want to talk to him about. Whereas Mike from The Humanist Report, I've invited on once. I don't even know if he saw that Twitter DM, but there is actually something very specific I want to talk to him about. I want Sam back on my show because there is something very specific I want to talk to him about. I would love to have Emma on my show. I'm not entirely sure what I would talk to her about. Like, there's all those things. That kind of come into play. But I do worry that by being so open, by trying to help other people understand their depression, their suicidal thoughts, that it's caused people to be a little bit more distanced to me. That it, it, like I know after having my YouTube channel, the thought of me getting a regular job, <laughs> if they Google my name and watch any of my videos, not going to happen. And a lot of that has to do with um, just my politics in general and, and you know, my anti-camp stance. But like at my last 
main, like the last stable job that I had, my best friend was my boss at the time. That's part of the reason why I got the job was I was referred by him. He didn't know at the time he was about to be my boss though. So that threw us through a loop. And we had lots of jokes about that. And he was vaguely aware of my mental health. He didn't know how bad it was, but he, he was slightly aware. And he was amazing to me. And he helped me through a lot of stuff. And he learned my depression with me. And at some point, we felt it was best to eventually go up to, you know, the um, manager of the department and disclose that there are certain needs that I have because this is a risk that if I don't show up to work one day, it might be because I'm no longer of this world. And it's hard to develop relationships with people when you're in this mind frame. But at the same time, I don't think this is going away. The things that I would need to have to happen in my life for me to not be in this state, I don't know if they're achievable. And then even if they were achieved, I don't know if it's just something in my head is fundamentally wired wrong for me to think this way. Because my last big attempt, I was more or less stable. I was in a relationship. I had the job. You know, I was out of debt. I had extra spending cash. I had a home. I had friend circles. And yet during that time is when I nearly died from my own hand. So the thing is, is that it might always be a risk. So does that mean I don't get the same opportunities as other people because I live with this? Is this a disability that people don't see past? Because this is the same for any work environment. They don't want to hire people that might end up killing themselves. But you hire people with a history of cancer in their family or heart conditions or, you know, there's, I've heard of people who just start a relationship and then they get a cancer diagnosis and their partner to be is so supportive and wants to be there for them and help them through it. But if you're just starting a relationship and then you acknowledge you have mental health issues, that's the end of the relationship. That's another reason why I'm so open with my mental health issues is that I don't want to have to disclose it after I've become attached to someone because I know then that most likely it would be the end of that relationship. So if somebody goes into it knowing ahead of time that I have these issues and, you know, they might not know if they're capable of handling them or working with me with them, but at least they're aware of it because the first time I went into the hospital in my early 20s, because that I don't call a suicide attempt, I call that one a cry for help because I categorize them differently for some reason, even though to outside eyes are all the same thing. But I lost all my friends at that point, friends that I had had over, for over a decade because I had hid my depression so well, none of them knew. And so when the moment came that I got pushed over the edge, to them, it does seem like it came out of nowhere and that it happened over nothing. But to me, I just didn't know how to tell people how bad it was. Because I also saw how my friends treated other friends with mental health issues. I had a friend who was anorexic in high school. She had to go into a special program and stuff. And I was the only one of her friends that would go and visit her every weekend in, in the uh, hospital that she was in. It wasn't like a hospital hospital. It was um, a place, a treatment center for people with eating disorders. And then I would go back with that circle of friends and then they would say, oh, she's just looking for attention and all that sort of stuff. Like, I don't get it. She's so skinny already. Why is this such an issue? Or it's like, if she's fat, then what does that make me? And all that sort of stuff. And so I would hear people talk about it, but they didn't realize that at that time in my own head, I was occasionally writing notes to my friends to leave them for after I died. So it, it is one of those things like, I don't, I don't know. I know I am horrible at networking, but is it? Is this part of the issue that if you want to be able to talk openly and honestly about your depression and your suicidal thoughts in the hopes of helping others, does that come at the cost of being successful with your channel or with friends or being out there with other people? And how many more people need to go out there and talk openly about this before it's understood and accepted? Because there are different types of stresses and some stresses I thrive under that would break a lot of people. Like if I'm, if I'm on left of shows and I start doing the circuit and I feel like I'm making a difference and I'm getting heard and all that sort of stuff, what that does is like, if I'm getting the message out there and changing people's minds, then that fuels me. That makes me feel better. That's my goal is I want to make a difference. Like I'm not on here to be the center of attention. <laughs> 
I don't want people to have to go through the same things I did. And for that, a lot of change needs to happen. So like, and again, like I said, I have no idea about the majority part. Like, yes, I constantly joke, joke <laughs> or less about wanting to go on or doing like a, a version of the majority report, but Canadian. I want to say like the majority report now with CanCon, but I don't know if legally you'd be allowed to say that unless it is actually CanCon certified. My ultimate goal is to have like a majority report style show, but Canadian. So Canadian interviews and experts and activists and then news stories like the ones that I've been covering in the after in the fun half. I wouldn't be able to host it on my channel though for logistic reasons, but that is something I would very much like to do. And having that, being on camera, even though there's the stress of having to deal with the toxic news and all that sort of stuff, but being able to get that message out there builds me up in ways that a lot of other people can't handle it. I can handle watching the horrible news every day because I compartmentalize so well. And I know it's because it's bigger than me. It's bigger than, you know, my thoughts and my feelings as to the change that I want to make. And because of that, I can push through a lot. At the same time, I can be very unstable for other outlying issues that has nothing to do with being in front of camera. And I'm very good at faking it, of having um, stage energy, as they call it, of pretending I'm okay when I'm not because I've had a lifetime of practice. And so where, where do you go from here? Because I can understand people like Sam and Emma who have a great deal of compassion and empathy that if they were to have somebody, a guest on their show, an interview or something like that, and that person then shortly after ended up ending their own life, I would imagine it would tear them up. And I know other people who are afraid of that with me. I know people who have lost others to suicide and they don't want to say anything to me. Like they've mentioned that they lost somebody to suicide and that it really upsets them. But then there's a bit of awkwardness because there's the risk that I might put them through that as well. And it, it's hard for me to explain because it's not something that I'm necessarily in control of in the moment. It's, I think I'm doing everyone a favor. So how do you network when you're this open about your mental health issues? Because I do see the change in people when I tell them about it. Before, like before when they, when, when I'm fine and acting normal, they treat me one way. But then as soon as they find out I have these mental health issues, you can see the change in them, like they're worried that I'm about to go off at any moment. But you don't live this long with suicidal ideation without being able to handle stress. Because <laughs> uh, the stress of having that thought in the back of your head every day, the strength it takes to wake up day after day in a life you hate, in a life that's causing you pain, so much pain, and you have no idea how you're going to get through it, and you have no idea if you're going to get through it. And how you want nothing more than it for it to end. But then you wake up and you find a way to get through it. Day after day after day. Requires a type of strength a lot of people don't understand. And it's easier for me to fight for others than it is for myself. Like it is with a lot of people. And when I'm making these videos, I'm fighting for all of you. I'm trying to get that message out there. Because like I said, I don't want other people to have to go through this. I want the mental health care in this country. I want people to understand it better so you don't have to be hidden. I want people to be able to freely talk about it so that they can start to understand some of their inner feelings. Am I stable right now? Sure. I don't know what tomorrow brings. And a lot of the times when I say I'm fine, I really do mean I'm fine. But it's hard for people to trust me when they know a lot of what's going on. That's what that segment brought out in me, and it's a part that I feel like isn't addressed enough. I don't know if I'm going to get through my current hurdle, but I also don't worry about it every day, and I don't want other people to have to worry about it every day. If there's one thing this ideation has taught me, it's to live in the moment, to, to take the opportunities and the chances when they're presented to me, because my options are to not try anything and know eventually I'm going to wear down and end my own life. Or to be bold and try things, knowing one of those things might push me off the edge, but another one of those things could, could be the thing that helps me get through this. Because why not give it a try? What's the worst that will happen? It, it makes me more willing to take on different challenges when 
I know I always have that out in the background. So why not go for it? Why not test my boundaries? Why not see what I am capable of? And sometimes I surprise myself. Never thought I'd be on Rebel HQ. I'd like to think I did a good job on it, even though at times during it, I was very unstable. But you wouldn't know that looking at my videos. People are capable of having friendships, relationships with people with other types of illnesses, yet there's still just so much stigma attached to mental health. But in order to have a relationship with me, it just means there has to be a lot more communication. I'm fully able to tell people what my triggers are, what's the best way to talk to me. If I have a meltdown and I go nonverbal, these are the things that I need. And I do that when I'm in a very stable mood so that when the time comes, they know the best way to handle me. It's kind of like mental health first aid. There's actually courses for that. I took one once. It was weird. But to me, that's no different than somebody saying, if I have a seizure, these are the things that you would need to do if you're near me. You know, make sure I'm on my side, make sure I don't swallow my tongue, make sure I don't bang my head. And then afterwards, I might need this and this and this from you. Or somebody who says, if I'm having an asthma attack, this is what I need. So if I were to say, if I'm having a panic attack, this is what I need. Why is that any different? But I hope this helps other people understand it better. I hope that made sense. It is one of those things that I don't know how much is oversharing when it comes to this sort of thing. I do tend to overshare as somebody who's autistic, and I've learned the hard way that sometimes it's really not appropriate, some of the things I say. And I do know that at times I've made people feel uncomfortable with talking too much about certain issues. And part of the reason why they're uncomfortable is sometimes how comfortable I am with talking about it. It's like if I'm talking about it, I should be like, oh, you know, you must condemn Hamas before you say anything else about what's happening over in Israel and Gaza. Just like you must do something about, you know, stating with your mental health, I'm stable right now and this and that and everything and blah, 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 before I can even start to address the topic. I just hope this helps others. I, I hope it helps people to understand what it's going through because it's happening to a lot more people than you think. They're just not saying anything. And maybe someday I will be on the majority report. You never know. <laughs> they are constantly being harassed for more Canadian contents. Like, just, you know, give your audience what they want, for crying out loud. I'll even wear my majority report toque. <laughs>